Okay, so hi everybody. Hope uh, everybody is well. Probably back from holidays or already uh, planning your um, your next little uh, weekend. Uh, so you know where to go. Yeah. <laughs> but we are here to um, we are here to talk about the history of Portugal. Um, I hope you like our little new studio. Uh, I thought it would be a bit more cozy uh, like that. Okay. Hope you like it. So. Uh, back to the story of Portugal, we are in the third part of our first series about the uh, Kingdom of Portugal. Last week we met Dona Teresa, the mother of Afonso Henriques, uh, the first king of Portugal. I've since posted, uh, posted on our Facebook page a picture of the map of the Iberic Peninsula. Uh, at that time with two-thirds occupied by the Moors and the North by the five Christian counties we talked about the, last, the, the past two weeks. You will also see uh, the, the family tree of King Afonso Henriques, his mother and his grandfather, the Emperor Afonso Seich. Have a look. Uh, I think it will help you visualize what um, we've been talking about the, la the, the last two weeks. Okay. So let's continue our journey into the amazing story of Portugal. So this week I'm taking you after the independence of the country of Portugal and the birth of the Kingdom of Portugal, still a small territory, through its consolidation and expansion within the territories of Portugal as we know it today. I also want to tell you about about the origin and source of the military order of Christ, very powerful in Portugal in the 12th and 13th century, who played a vital and absolute unique role in the birth and expansion of Portugal, very linked with the Templiers, the Templars, um, that we will cover later. So last week we saw that uh, Lisbon was taken back from the Moors in 1147, with the help already of the English troops on their way to J Jerusalem for the Crusades, therefore moving already further south from the original county of Portugal, borders with the Moorish Kingdom. We can see that the reconquest, you remember, was fully accomplished with Afonso Treis, liberated, uh, who liber liberated Faro in the Algarve in 1249 from the Moors, more than a hundred years after Afonso Henriques had declared the county of Portugal independent in 1143 from the kingdom of Leon and Castile, precisely because he wanted to fight against the Moors. However, Castile would only recognize the sovereignty of Portugal over the Algarve about 50 years later in 1297. I mean, the Spanish didn't really want to get the Portugal uh, away, g uh, gone away, and you will see there will be a lot, lot of ten uh, tentative to um, to take back um, Portugal or at least part of it. Uh, but we will cover that in our uh, uh, later in our seri um, next series. So there were constant territorial disputes from Castile during the early years of the Portuguese independence and there were some tentative Moorish incursion from within the Spanish territory as we know it today of Al-Andalus. Because, of course, Portugal had its borders but uh, the Moors were still on the Spanish side of the peninsula. So in the early 1300s, Portugal, with extensive help of the Templars, which we'll talk about uh, in our more details when talking about the Order of Christ, had already secured a stable territory, most of which conquered back from the Moors in the course of the Iberic Crusades. The south and west were a great opening to the vast and unknown Atlantic Ocean, full of legend and promise of hidden treasures. We will see that when covering the golden age of the discoveries. I mean, obviously, with not the, with not the, the, the borders, inline borders, more or less, 
uh, drone, not secure, because you will see there will be lots of in incursion. Um, Portugal had had to look uh, to the ocean. So to the north, um, so talking about the borders of uh, of Lisbon, uh, to the north, um, it was divided from Galicia, one of the five Christian countries uh, and a province of the Kingdom of Leon and Castile, by the uh, Minho River. And the border with the kings of Castile to the east was well defined. Whereas to the south, in the Algarve, the fortress, the fortress of Castro Marin, uh, which was going to be the first seat of the Order of Christ, on the west bank of the Guadiana River, if you go, it's very close to uh, Cadiz, beautiful place, guarded the country from any attempts that could have been made by the Taifash or kingdoms of the Moors, of the Al-Andalus, Al so still on the Spanish side. And it would actually take a United Spanish Kingdoms, the United Spanish Kingdoms, under Isabel la Catholic, la Catholica, almost 200 years, 200 more years, to conquer Granada in 1492 and close their side of the story as far as war with the Arabs was concerned. So, uh, you know, for 200 years, the Arabs were still in the peninsula on the Spanish border. It's only uh, at the end of the 15th century that the whole peninsula was free of the Moors. So for that effect, um, i.e. to uh, defend the Portuguese borders from the kingdom of Leon and the Moorish, still in the Spanish side of the Al-Andalus, King Danish, the successor of Afonso Trech, which just spoke about him, who uh, so, uh, liberated Faro. Um, King Danish was busy building castles to defend the border from the Castilian attacks, and, and he started to expand the navy in order to consolidate the fragile independence of Portugal. Uh, about the navy, we will come back to that in much more details when we cover the, um, the discoveries. But already at that time, he, uh, King Danish was uh, thinking about rebuilding um, the navy because they were talking; they were th already thinking about going in in the ocean. Probably not to go as far as uh, as India, which was the aim of the of the discoveries. But you know, they had their borders secure. Now they were looking outwards. Um, so one one of the castles that King Danish. Uh, built was uh, for his wife Isabel in Obidosh as a wedding present. I mean, pretty nice present. Um, I mention it because this castle uh, and the city of Obidosh is very close to um, to Lisbon. It's about 45 minutes drive, so you can go there for a day, and it's a beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, if you have when you are here and you have time, you should definitely go there. And uh, uh, once once a year. During the uh, a weekend, they reenact the life in the Middle Ages. Uh, I'll keep you posted about those dates. So um, the territorial dispute between Portugal and Castile at the start of the Portugal independence came to a head in 1383 when King Fernando I of Portugal, the legitimate son of Pedro I, dies, but with no son to succeed him. So Fernando, son-in-law, son in so the husband of his uh, daughter, um, Beatrice, so Juan I of Castile, uh, took this opportunity to try to claim the, Port the, the Portuguese throne uh, for his wife. Okay, so he took, that op he, <laughs> he took that opportunity to try to actually re-annex already uh, Portugal to, to Spain. So actually, Juan I of Castile temporarily invaded Portugal, but most of the people were against him, and they, they saw it very well as an attempt to virtually re-annex already Portugal to the Kingdom of Castile. And that fo so there, there, there follows what has been uh, called in the history books as the two years crisis between 1383 and 1385, where actually for two years there was a total political anarchy. Uh, nobody, no monarch was uh, ruling the country. So during those two years, the, uh, the Portuguese opponents of Ju uh, Juan I of Castile literally placed to the throne of Portugal Fernando Alves' brother, 
So Pedro first illegi illegitimate son, Juan Juan of Avish, okay, who was elected by the Council of the Kingdom, uh, the equivalent of the Cortes or Parliament in Coimbra in 1385. And he, he went on to defeat the same year the Castilian army led by Juan I of Castile. So the husband, the, uh, the husband of his half brother daughter. Do you follow? <laughs> The, bro the husband of his half-brother daughter. So the same year at the Battle of Aljubarota. Al this is a very, a very famous battle here in Portugal. And actually, I just saw very recently uh, on TV uh, um, a program about that, uh, that battle. I think they were celebrating the 670. can remember. Well, you have to do the, the math. <laughs> um, so that was a, an important uh, episode of the history of Portugal. And uh, also was mentioning, but we will talk about it later, the, the Dominican Abbey of Santa Maria da Vitoria in Batalha. It's one of the Manueline masterpiece of Portuguese uh, Gothic architecture, which was actually built in a celebration of that victory. And very, very much worth visiting when, when you are It's a bit further. Uh, it's about an hour and a half. Uh, but we'll talk about that because uh, there is a nice little circuit that we can help you organize if you want to go further than Lisbon and visit some of those, uh, some of those um, monuments. So, Juan of Castille, okay, it's difficult because they always have the same name. It's Juan I of Castile and Juan of Avish de Portugal. So Juan I of Castile was um, accompanied by French allied cavalry while the English troops took the side of the Portuguese. Okay? So the Castilian forces were uh, well, abandoned Santarem, Torres Vedras and Torres Novas. And I'm, I'm mentioning those three cities because we will talk about them again um, during the time of the Napoleonic uh, invasion, okay, uh, which were actually the three cities where the fe the fiercest battle uh, happened uh, between the troops of Wellington and, and of Napoleon. So from then, we can say uh, so from that battle of uh, Aljubarrota, we can say that the stability of the Portu of the Portuguese throne was permanently uh, secured. And actually, two years after that uh, victory, in 1387, Jean I of Portugal married Philippa of Lancaster. Um, and she, she was the sister of the soon-to-be Henry IV of England. So the marriage consolidated these, that Anglo-Portuguese alliance which existed already and which still endures uh, to the present day. A very, very strong alliance between the the Portuguese and the English. So Jean I of Portugal consolidated his position and Portugal independence through that very important uh, marriage with um, Philippa of Lancaster. Okay, And that follows a long reign of uh, Jean. So after all this uh, instability, there was a long reign uh, from Jean I of Portugal. And actually, that was the start uh, of the first maritime expedition still not at all the discoveries, but the first uh, maritime expedition led by his uh, son, the, uh, his third son actually, everybody knows his name, Henry the Navigator. But that will be for the next uh, series about the golden age of Portugal and the discoveries. Okay, so very quickly, two little stories to finish. One, it's only in 1256, about a hundred years after his independence, that Lisbon became formally the capital of Portugal in place of Coimbra. Okay, okay, it was a hundred years after the independence, but it is since 1256 that Lisbon is the capital of Portugal. So I don't think there are many countries who can say the capital has been <laughs> for such a long time. And second, I said I was going to talk to you about the. Uh, the Order of Christ, but this video is already a bit too long, so we'll do a special next week about the Order of Christ and the, and the, the connection with the Templiers, the Templars. You'll see, very interesting. And I still would like to say a little bit more about the city of Coimbra, which for me is a, an amazing and beautiful uh, student university, uh, which was, you know, for 100 years capital of Portugal. 
uh, after having been the capital of the Por of the county of Portugal, so very long history, and who was you know a bit later on during the independent the uh, the Renaissance was going to compete with Oxford and Cambridge. So fascinating city. So we'll have a special next week about uh, the Order of Christ and the city of Coimbra. Okay. So that's it for, 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 for today, for this week. So as usual, like the video, I hope you liked it. Um, subs click the subscribe the button of the YouTube channel. Share, talk to your friends about it. Um, visit our website, www.lisbonnaturally.com. Of course, you know it. And uh, we hope to see you here very soon. And I hope you are engaging and you are talking to your friends. I know probably now is not the best time because everybody is kind of, you know, coming back from holiday and it's the start of the of the schools for some and or universities for others. So it's a busy time, I know. But um, I hope those information on Facebook, on YouTube, um, helps you, you know, keeping in mind Lisbon and then when you have a weekend and you want to get away and uh, visit a beautiful country with lots of history uh, come and come and you know where to go and come and come and see us okay all right thanks and uh, we'll talk very soon i'm sure okay thank you have a nice week thanks bye